Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct News. Sam I. B. DeGangie reporting for The Media Speaks. And friends, let me tell you something. Tonight, <coughs> we have some of the most... I don't even know how to word it. <coughs> some of the most disturbing news, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, Autocrat Feinstein defends high-tech Stasi surveillance state in op-ed. Once again, a coughing spell. Sam I. B. DeGangie reporting for the Media Speaks. Half truths and scary bedtime stories. Kurt Nemo, Infowars. Senator Dianne Feinstein on Sunday took to the pages of the Wall Street Journal to defend the federal government's brazen defilement of the Fourth Amendment and constitutional rights for all Americans. Feinstein has oh wait my exact my beautiful Feinstein picture. Feinstein has consistently supported authoritarian government, including numerous proposals to outlaw firearms guaranteed by the Second Amendment. But her exploitation of the so-called terror threat and defense of the NSA reveal how desperate the government is to defend the high-tech Stasi state now operational in America. Her defense, it says, of totalitarianism under the ruse of an omniscient terror threat is remarkable. Our safety depends on the ability of 16 U.S. intelligence agencies, including those at the state, in the military, and at the FBI, to discover unfolding plots by tracking connections between terrorists, especially plots tied to the U.S. homeland. That is why the NSA's call records program is an essential component of U.S. counterterrorism efforts, she writes. Interestingly, it goes on, Feinstein mentions Khalid al Medhar, the supposed al-Qaeda operative said to be involved in 9-11 attacks. Consider the case of Khalid al Mahar, who was being watched by the CIA while he was in Malaysia. U.S. intelligence agencies failed to connect the dots before the attack to recognize that Al Mildar had flown with future hijacker Nawaf Al Hamzi to Los Angeles in January of 2000. And then it goes on to use the exact quote that it says, which I just read to you. Ms. Feinstein, however, fails to tell the whole story, which is a pathological trait of far too many government employees citing the supposed terror threat as they prepare to steal our liberty. Khalid Al-Milar settled in the United States with the help of Saudi intelligence operative Omar Al-Bayoumi, B-A-Y-O-U-M-I. The FBI knew about Al-Bayoumi and his activities, but Feinstein neglects this inconvenient little fact. The shady Saudi acted as co-signer and guarantor for the apartment rental application of Al-Milar and fellow supposed hijacker Nawaf Al-Zami. He also paid their rent, introduced the pair to the local Muslim community, the religion of peace, and hooked them up with another supposed hijacker, Hane Hanjar, the failed flying student, who we are told acrobatically flew American Airlines 77 into the Pentagon. Although the FBI would later claim Hanjar was not on their radar, informants have stated otherwise. In addition to working with Saudi intelligence operative, the pair had closed-door meetings with Anwar Arulaki at the time of the uh, Imam of a San at that time, excuse me, the Imam of a San Diego mosque. In addition to a connection to Al Bayami, the Saudi intelligence Arulaki, uh, who is said to plan the comical Christmas Day underwear bombing fiasco the Fort Hood shooting, and the aborted fireworks square bombing died at the Pentagon following the 9-11 attacks. Um, it also says Feinstein fails to report that Ibrahim al-Assari, paraded by the establishment media as a scary al-Qaeda bombing mastermind, has yet to manufacture and deploy an effective bomb to take down an aircraft. Additionally, Feinstein's reference to non-metallic bombs is nothing if not a comical red herring. Explosive experts, including renowned terrorism expert and Pentagon advisor Marvin Citron. I give you these names so you can't say that I'm a conspiracy theorist. It's all right here, the links. I tell you where to find it. Have dismissed the idea of an Al-Qaeda liquid bomb as a Hollywood fantasy. 
Liquid bombs require hours to prepare, even after being smuggled on board, plus a lot of ice to keep them cool during the entire process, Citron said in 06. To remain undetected, they also need passengers and a flight crew with a defective sense of smell. And they are likely to blow up in mid preparation with just enough force to kill the chemist and no one else. So, what, what of this argument then? That spying is the only thing that's keeping us safe. What, what of this? Well, I'm going to go to Washington's blog. This is a very long article. So I'm going to go through parts because every time I just sit here and read an article, I have two views. Nobody wants to watch a guy read into the camera. Having said that, I think I'm going to do a little bit of reading in this. You're going to want to hear this. They have not managed to result in one single foiled terrorist plot with all of the NSA spying that Snowden uh, has uh, heroically shown everyone. Let me ask you something. You got the proverbial needle in the haystack. I read this analogy uh, months ago and I still like it. It's harder to find a needle in a haystack when you keep increasing the hay. Uh, in other words, it's better to go through a bale of hay to look for a needle than it is for a barn full of hay. And a barn full of hay is what you're doing when you take everybody's phone information and metadata and expect to go through it to find the person who is fixing to make the sonic boom. Point is, there isn't going to be any sonic boom detected if you have so many people to go through. I mean, how many people make jokes about bombing every day? I mean, I'm not kidding. You take everybody that, that they're surveying, I mean... Right there, just, just or, or, uh, you know, this guy's bombing my phone. Uh, anything like that. Bam, red flag. Suddenly you can't tell who the terrorists are anymore because you've been looking through uh, the uh, texting irresponsibilities of a 14-year-old. Washington's blog, October 16th. And uh, October 16th, day of infamy, by the way. I have been without a father for a year now. Rest in peace, Samuel T. DeGangie. We love to miss you. Preface, the Bush and Obama administrations have claimed for more than a decade that spying on Americans was justified by 9-11. Senator Dianne Feinstein, head of the SETI Intelligence Committee, is now trotting out the same old, tired justification. And there's a link. There's links to all this. Again, go to Washington's blog. It says, NSA spying did not result in a single foiled terrorist plot. Tech Dirt notes, Feinstein goes on to make claims that have already been debunked. Uh, working in combination, the call records, uh, database, and other NSA programs have aided efforts by the U.S. intelligence agencies <coughs> to disrupt terrorism in the U.S. approximately a dozen times in recent years, according to the NSA. This summer, the agency disclosed that 54 terrorists, or terrorist events, have been interrupted, including plots stopped and arrests made for support of terrorism. Thirteen events were in the U.S. homeland and nine involved U.S. persons or facilities overseas. Twenty-five were in Europe, five in Africa, and eleven in Asia. The NSA chief himself admits, with Link, the numbers are wildly inflated and there were only one or two terrorist plots foiled. The NSA's deputy director says that at the most, one plot might have been disrupted with another link by the bulk phone records collection alone. In other words, they're going through everybody's phone records. They're violating our God-given first about Fourth uh, Amendment rights uh, for you Darwinists, uh, the one you were born with, your birthright, if you will. Um, well, they violated the Fourth Amendment in total to catch what might have been one person. Now, granted, that's a big deal to the one person that gets it. I'm not saying that. Even if it killed, you know, a thousand people. My point is, you cannot go through the phone records of every single person and expect to catch these people. The point is, there are a whole bunch of people probably building bombs everywhere and nobody's able to catch them because 
They've got too many, uh, too much hay looking for the needle. Again, the earlier analogy. That's why I used it. So I'm going to keep going back to it. They've got too much hay. Um, not enough horses. You've got a mess here, and you think that there's only one person looking to, to, to hurt us? There are other people out there right now that are getting away with it because the NSA is pulling in too much data from innocent people whose Fourth Amendment rights they violated to be able to focus on anything using the thinking part of their brain. That is the correct view. So what did they catch? They caught a cab driver and three other people. They raised $8,500 and sent it to Somalia. And even the FBI admits it might not have even been a political donation. It might have been a tribal donation. Um, the cab driver and three other men, that breaks down to $2,125 a piece that they donated to Somalia. Now you can do a lot of damage with $8,500, you know, I guarantee it. But in the scheme of things, it's pocket change. They violated the rights of every American citizen. They violated the rights of people in Brazil and other countries to intercept a cab driver and three of his friends, $8,500. Now, I will say this, having been a cab driver, that is an absolute damn fortune to us. And worst job ever. But, uh, oh, well, now telemarketing's worse. But, um, oh, good Lord. I mean, wow. Way to go. So, and there's more and more data all the way through this. It talks about how they knew Mindar, that's the, the guy that flew the plane into the buildings. The government had followed him, and there's links for all of this. The government knew that he was calling people and that he was linked to terrorism. And they said without the NSA spying, they couldn't tell who was making the calls. Once someone is linked to terrorism, it has always been legal in this country to tap their phones. It wasn't NSA spying that led them to notice that he was a terrorist. It was other things that he was doing that the FBI and the CIA and all the I-chart agencies have been able to handle very well for a very long time. Uh, and that's not to say that everything they do is done well. That's not what I said. What I said is they're very good at catching people who make mistakes like that. And uh, thankfully so. I mean, let's, let's face it. Uh, do I think we need all of them? No. But my point is that um, they knew about this. And then, I mean, Israel warned us about this. Let me see if I can quickly scan to it, because it was, it was a sentence that just jumped out at me. Um, no, I can't, I, I can't let this go. Sorry, people watching me scroll, but uh, no, th this can't be overstated. We were warned by Israel that this was going to happen. Investigators for the Congressional Joint Inquiry discovered that an FBI informant had hosted and even rented a room for two hijackers in 2000, that is before 2001 for you Lady Gaga fans. And when the inquiry sought to interview the informant, the FBI refused outright and then hid him in an unknown location that a high-level FBI official stated that these blocking maneuvers were unbroken under the orders from the White House. And again, it's linked as BuzzFlash. Uh, go and look that article up. Or, you know, again, go to the one that I'm reading from and you'll see it right away. This has been going on forever. They knew about these people. They knew what they were trying to do to us. So don't let them say that they need all of this, you know, great intel in order to be able to keep us safe. That's absolute horse manure. We were warned over and over again, and uh, we knew who these, these people were, and they, they let it happen. It's that simple. And, I mean, go look, I mean, there's got to be 15 links on here, all going to different publications, all with documents that all prove the same thing. You can call me crazy if you want to, I don't give a damn. The point is, I didn't make this up. I can give you a billion uh, references. Go ahead, argue with them. I'm just showing you what was found. Kill the messenger. All right, guys, business standard, Taliban mark U.S. over government shutdown. Yeah, well, we can mock them for worshiping somebody who uh, is a messenger of God, and yet his message kept changing, but we won't get into that. And again, 
the peaceful Muslims, I'm just clowning. You can clown me if you want to. I'm a Christian. We get clowned all the time. Taliban mock U.S. over government shutdown. Taliban militants fighting U.S. troops in Afghanistan taunted Washington today over the government shutdown, which has ended. Media speaks. has all you need to know about it. Accu well, it's about to be ending. Accusing U.S. politicians of sucking the blood of their own people. The Islamist militants issued a statement describing how U.S. institutions were quote, paralyzed, the Statue of Liberty was closed, and a fall in tourist numbers had hit shops, restaurants, and hotels in the capital. The American people should realize that their politicians play with their destinies, as well as the destinies of other oppressed nations, for the sake of personal vested interests, the Taliban said. All right, you know what? Unfortunately, the Taliban is painfully right about most of the things they say. However, I would say Islamist needs uh, the uh, Islamist people. The Islamic people should realize that their religions play with the destinies as well as the destinies of other oppressed nations for the sake of their personal vested interest. You could turn that around. So I'm not saying the Taliban are wonderful people. The insurgents accuse selfish and empty-minded American leaders of taking U.S. citizens' money earned with great difficulty and then lavishly spending the same money and shedding the blood of innocent and oppressed people. In that instance, they're right. There's like what, 350,000 Iraqis that were not even in the war that we killed, like casualties. So, I mean, yeah, they have a point there. I mean, just because they're scum doesn't mean they have a point. Instead of sucking the blood of their own people, the money should be utilized for the sake of peace. That's like Hitler is saying that the money should be used to help the Jewish religion. The Taliban knows very little about peace. Do I think we need to be fighting them? No, but let's face it, they are not a peaceful people. A Taliban, again, I said that about not Islam. The U.S. Embassy in Kabul has said that it expects to function normally in the short term due to the shutdown, though its Twitter feed would not be updated. Look! It says uh, 57,000 U.S. troops were deployed in Afghanistan, with most of them set to pull out by the end of next year. So I guess we brought such wonderful things to them that now they're going to go ahead and preach to us. Look, I don't even pretend to know people exactly what it is that goes through the minds of our leaders. But I will say it is rather sad to have to admit that the Taliban, of all people, have a point. Because we're not exactly talking about the most uh, democratic regime then either. Worst uh, governments ever. Guys, uh, BudK.com. Go to the Mediaspeaks.com and then click on the BudK ad. Do it in that order, it helps us. And when you do, we're going to go to the $5 wallet savers. I don't think I've ever done these before. What can you get at BudK? Well, it's getting close enough to Christmas time. Pull string uh, perimeter alarms, 72 pack, $4.99. You can alarm your home for almost nothing here. Tactical Warrior Tonto Neck Knife with Lanyard and Sheath for those of you that uh, have a knife collector, $2.98. The M48 Commando Waterproof Matchboxes Signal Striker, $3.99. Emergency Survival Sleeping Blanket, $1.99. $1.99 for an emergency survival sleeping blanket. If you ever freeze to death after hearing this, do know that the correct views was going to save you for just $2. Friends, go to TheMediaSpeaks.com, click on Bud K, and help us. I mean, that's exactly what it does. When you buy something that way, it absolutely helps us. We're going to click on to Spain. Oh, Spain, Spain, Spain. In the Dunce Camp, the Dunce Camp of the Month Award, many of you know I give out the Dunce Camp of the Month Award every month. Somebody said, you know, calling other people a dunce doesn't make you smarter. I say it did. I'm as smart as I am. And the people that I call dunces are dunces. Doesn't change my intelligence at all to point to their lack of intelligence. Um, if the Dunce Camp of the Month Award was in fact international, and if you would like it to be international, Leave a comment. And it was international. And I mail a dunce cap and a dunce cap certificate explaining why they got it to somebody every single month. Police stations, DNR, uh, you name it, everybody's got the dunce cap. Um, look it up. Spain considers taxing the sun. Well, they certainly would be eligible for said dunce cap. 
You know the Spanish economy is in dire straits when politicians propose a tax on the sun. Far from rewarding enterprising citizens by offering net metering debates, Spain is considering a more ass-backwards approach by instead taxing those who would dare to take it upon themselves to produce their own energy. In alleged efforts to tackle a debt mountain of $35 billion, Spain's energy sector wants solar panel users to pay a backup toll, essentially forcing people who use solar panels to pay for self-consumption. They give them one penny, they're out of their damn mind. Probably steal it off of them. We will be the only country in the world charging for the use of the sun. The director of a Spanish sustainable energy firm named CIBA, Juan Sarasolas, S-E-R-A-S-O-L-E-S-C-S, told BBC, strange things are happening in Spain, and this is one of them. Strange, no, stupid. Those who produce their own energy through solar panels typically accrue enough savings to pay for them within eight years. The new solar tax would ensure that timeline extends to 25 years. STEALING! The logic behind the proposal, and I can't believe they used the word logic, is that with increased self-consumption, the income for conventional energy systems will decrease, but grid maintenance will cost the same, according to the BBC. Well, maybe you shouldn't have encouraged the entire country to have citizens who would go in this direction. See, people, this is another reason they're eligible. If they're worried about their grid, they should have worried about that before they made promises to the people who put solar panels up. I'm sorry, these people don't owe one damn penny to the infrastructure. Not one damn penny. If I produce my own energy, but am connected to the grid, having to keep back up in case of my production fails, I have to contribute to the cost of the entire system, Energy Secretary Alberto Nato explained. In other words, even though the Spanish government was responsible for a massive campaign six years ago, in other words, they asked for this, and then they probably knew what they were going to do, but they hid it from the sheeple. Promoting solar energy, the people that actually jumped on the initiative are now burning the holes in their pockets of Spain's five biggest energy companies, and the taxpayers may once again, uh, must once again come to the rescue. Dutch lawyer uh, Piet Holtrop has assumed the task of defending over 1,000 people who, due to the proposed tax, are now in danger of holding toxic access and even losing their homes. It's an excuse. And look, the communists in Spain and everybody, oh, communists, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Oh, well, there you go. That's what communism does. Read it and weep. The majority of people are like your own parents who at one time had savings and wanted to make an investment on a better return, Holtrop says. Many of these people are going to lose their homes that they used as collateral to buy the solar panels. They are unable to pay back at the bank. They can't sell the installations because the government has made them toxic access, assets. He says that although the toll has yet to go into effect, the photovoltaic sector is already feeling the pinch, and nobody is going to make significant effort if it takes 20 years to pay it off. So that is how you take a good idea, and by the way, man-man global warming is an absolute lie. Look up ClimateGate. Look up ClimateGate 2013. Um, but having said that, I think uh, moving in the solar direction is much better than having all this in our air, giving us lung cancer. We know it does that. It doesn't warm the planet, but it kills the people. Um, the things holding these kind of energies back, as Kyle Phillips has said many times, is the government and the system. The people, they got it. Two more stories, friends. Another radioactive leak at Fukushima. Always there's the monthly Fukushima up massive update. That's why I need you to hit subscribe. But another reason to hit subscribe is that I cover Fukushima. Oh, let's face it, I cover Fukushima rather often. Did I take a picture for Fuku today? Yes, I did. Um, and these poor people making you know, $10 an hour equivalent to work there. And most of them, uh, unfortunately, are from uh, backgrounds where they, either they don't know what they're doing to themselves or uh, they're too uneducated. Uh, again, there are some absolute heroes there doing it for the good of Japan. I'm not saying that, but... TEPCO has been caught, which is GE, have been caught repeatedly uh, picking people that really don't know any better and getting them to do the more menial tasks there, and they'll die of cancer and they'll have very bad lives. 
The operator of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant has reported that four tons of rainwater contaminated with low levels of radiation leaked during an operation to transfer the water between holding tank areas. Uh, again, this is uh, stuff.com.nz. I think I was calling the picture up and neglected to say that. Tokyo Electric Power Corp, where TEPCO has been trying to contain contaminated water, um, that the site after it found 300 tons of radioactive water had leaked from a tank at the plant, and I reported on that at nauseum. Heavy rain <coughs> during a recent typhoon flooded one of the tank holding areas where TEPCO stores excess water, flushed over damaged reactors to keep them cool, a spokesman said. After tests last month showed that rainwater contained 160 becquerels per liter of radiation, a relatively low level, TEPCO officials decided to transfer the water to another holding area for tanks. Uh, let me pause for a second here. First of all, we don't know how bad, uh, again, it's 4.56 in the morning, 10.17, uh, 2013 in Canton, Ohio, where I'm at right now. We won't know for a couple hours. TEPCO knows probably now as the sun's coming up. TEPCO knows how bad the typhoon actually did to Fukushima. The rest of the world, as of this report, does not know. I will let you know as soon as I find out. The other thing I want to say is 160 becquerels, which they are calling low level, is 160 nuclear uh, tiny, tiny explosions that happen in your body every second. That, that, my friends, is what a becquerel is. So if you think 160 little explosions in your body begging to give you cancer is low, cancer is low level, then I guess in that instance you would be right. Let me go on. Oops. After tests last month showed the rainwater contained 160 becquerels per leak, oh, I'm sorry, during the transfer, a worker found a leak, which the company estimated to be four tons and was absorbed into the ground, the spokesman said. The company faces the prospect of more heavy rain in the next few days as another storm approaches. So this thing is leaking like a sieve. I don't have a huge update today, but I want you guys to know when I'm reporting of these leaks, um, in most instances, these are not me reporting on the same leak. I'm reporting on all these little leaks. How many of you have been keeping, not little leagues, like baseball, little leaks. How many of you have been keeping track of these? It's like an awful lot of little leaks that don't mean anything, doesn't it? At what point do they add up to a problem since they are cumulative? Uh, for those of you that don't know, that means they, they get stronger and stronger at more deadly as they accumulate, they don't dissipate. Uh, some elements do, but cesium, strontium, uh, uranium, plutonium, those things do not. So they keep spilling into the ocean with these little leaks, these little leaks, these little leaks. Seem unusual to anybody else? Seem like it might be tied to the poison fish and the deaths that we're seeing of infants and elderly people with strange cancers up and down the west coast where you shouldn't be living? Last thing I want to get to, guys, natural news bombshell. Um, this is from September 3rd. And <coughs> if I don't die first, I absolutely could not get this out of my head. So I had to report it. I was going to delete it because I'm festering here. I haven't reported it. I got to do it. Serious chemical weapons turn out to be sodium fluoride, which is used in America's water supply. Sodium fluoride is so toxic that you can make a, a, a chemical weapon out of it. It wasn't sarin gas that was used. Now listen to this. Natural News can now reveal that the Syria chemical weapons narrative being pushed by the White House is an outlandish hoax. To understand why, you have to start with the story published in The Independent entitled Revealed Government Let British Company Export Nerve Gas Chemicals to Syria. Sounds scary, right? The Independent reports that the government was accused of breathtaking laxity in its arms controls last night after it emerged that officials authorized the export to Syria of two chemicals capable of being used to make a nerve agent such as sarin a year ago. What exactly are those two dangerous chemicals that need to be controlled via arms control regulations? They are sodium fluoride and potassium fluoride. Now, stay with me. You can see this for yourself in the screen capture of the independent story, and of course it's here. Um, 
U.S. water fluoridation chemical is serious chemical weapon. If these chemical names sound familiar, that's because sodium fluoride is the same toxic chemical that's routinely dumped into municipal water supplies all across the USA under the guise of water fluoridation. In fact, the forced feeding of sodium fluoride to the U.S. population is called a public health victory by the CDC, FDA, and dentists everywhere. Yet the same chemical, when sold to Syria, is openly and repeatedly referred to as a chemical weapon. This is true across the BBC, The Guardian, Daily Record, and Sunday Mail, France24.com, and literally thousands of other websites. As you might have guessed, Secretary of State John Kerry is running around pulling a George Bush claiming Syria has used chemical weapons of mass destruction. But what exactly is he saying? That hair samples have tested positives for signatures of sarin, not sarin itself. What is a signature of sarin? The fluorine element, which is of course the basis for sodium fluoride. And then there's a whole lot of science here, automatically, that proves all of it. I'm going to skip it, but it's in the article. Do you want to watch me read science off a computer screen? Are you going to trust me or you got to look it up? Um, it says, because it's crucial to understanding the hoax being per perpetrated by the White House, tests on hair and other tissues is done using ICPMS, the most common elemental analysis technology used today. And they would not be able to distinguish between even fluor fluoride, sodium fluoride and sarin. Um, and there's five elements that make it up. Uh, fluorine, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. Of those five elements, four of them uh, occur naturally in the human body in large quantities. Fluorine is the only element that strongly stands out against the rest in terms of elemental analysis. Fluorine is the same element, it says, that forms the basis for sodium fluoride. Sarin can, of course, be detected as a complete molecule using liquid chromatography systems, HPLC, but this is a highly unlikely to have taken place since the instability of the inherent instability of the molecule, which breaks apart. So, they're putting fluoride in our water, they're putting it in baby formula and food, they're putting it everywhere. And it's one of the elements used to make sarin nerve gas uh, equivalents. Guys, it's not enough to hurt us. I don't know. How much water do you drink? Do you swim a lot? I bathe every day. I don't know if you heathens that bathe every four days. I don't know. Uh, friends, I'm kidding. I'm in a good mood today. You're listening to Sam I.B. DeGangie of The Media Speaks. Correct views, signing off. Friends, do me a favor, go to TheMediaSpeaks.com, hit Bug K. Um, I'm upgrading my system. I had some driver's malfunction and I accidentally completely eliminated uh, my ability to edit videos on Adobe Premiere. So I have to get it all back uploaded again. I don't have a lot of graphics and music and all that, but I'm still recording HD and, uh, I don't know, at the 